Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 357. Take risks. If you succeed, you'll be happy. If you fail, you'll be wiser. Agent 7. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host. Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by FilmTools.com. Since 1996, FilmTools has been Hollywood's one-stop shop for all things production. No matter what your filmmaking needs, FilmTools has you covered when you need gear for your next shoot. Anytime I need anything really quickly, I go to FilmTools. They always have every single kind of production nugget and thing that I might need. No matter how small or big it is, they definitely have it. And this week, FilmTools is offering the Indie Film Hustle Tribe 5% off all purchases at filmtools.com. Just use the coupon code IFHPOD. That's I-F-H-P-O-D at the checkout at filmtools.com. The show is also sponsored by my new book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business. In it, I discuss how to actually create the film entrepreneur model and how to make money with your film or films and do it again and again so you can actually build a successful career and business. So if you want to pre-order the book, head over to filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. So guys, today on the show, we have filmmaker Todd Jenkins, whose film Cherokee Creek was, uh, first of all, an odyssey to get made in the first place, but then got caught in the hurricane, the storm that is Distriber. His story is heart-wrenching, and I wanted to bring him on the show not only to discuss um, the difficulties he had making the movie, but I really did want to put a face to the pain and suffering that so many filmmakers are going through right now because of this gross and devastating situation that we have going on with Distriber and uh, and what we could do to fix it. So we do talk a little bit about what's happening, where we're at with it. But I just wanted, you know, people in the tribe to understand that it is not just, you know, a filmmaker here, a filmmaker there. We're talking about thousands of filmmakers and millions of dollars lost. Families out there are really being affected. Companies are going to close or really be hurt. The ripple effects of this situation are going to be pretty massive. So Todd decided to come on and be completely raw, completely honest about everything he's going through, the numbers, the money he's lost. He was just a real champion to come on, really, man, and to be so uh, so open about everything. So I, I really hope you enjoy this episode. It's going to be pretty eye-opening. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Todd Jenkins. I'd like to welcome to the show filmmaker Todd Jenkins, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. Thanks, man, for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, man. We have um, we I, I we've been introduced. I mean, I, I think you've been listening to me for a little while, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, I listened to you a whole lot more once the distributor thing happened, and I, I learned that you were you were full of knowledge of, of a lot of valuable information that I needed to know. So <laughs> okay, good. So I, uh, I was not having people, you know, driving to L.A. and, and checking things out myself because. I wasn't getting my first quarter payments from distributor, and I was in a panic. Well, we I didn't were, know I didn't know how many other people were going through the same shit I was. So it was great to hear there was other people, mm-hmm. but I know it fucking sucks, you know. And without without question, and we're going to get all into distributor in a little bit. But I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about your story about how you made your independent film Cherokee Crete. So tell me about the film and how it came into into life. <laughs> Uh, as far as conception, all the way back to that. <laughs> I mean, not conception, but just let's say you know, okay. like starting um, the the production of it. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, well, I've been in the industry, working in front and behind the camera for about twenty years now, and uh, you know, I kept hearing horror story after horror story of every movie that would go through the the, the normal distribution uh, map. Mm-hmm. You know, they just people were never making money. And I was always like a producer on these projects, but a lot of times I didn't get, you know, all the information or they wouldn't tell me for whatever reason. Mm. Um, so I decided if I wanted to know everything and be in control, I was going to have to do it myself. And plus, as an actor, I wanted to I was getting really pissed off that these roles weren't happening. You know, you get up, you get up for these parts, for these huge studio films, and then they could just pull the carpet out from underneath you at the last second. 
So you're kind of like, dude, I got to do something. So if you look at a lot of the great actors today, a lot of them just did their own thing to get known. So I was like, man, I'm going to do that path. You know, I'm going to do my own movie. Uh, I'll control everything. And if it's anybody's fault, it'll be mine. And I'll know 100 percent of what goes right or goes wrong. So I, I had the bright idea that I would do Cherokee Creek. <laughs> OK, fair enough. Um, you know, and then I started hearing about distributing all these things. And I thought that might be a way to go. But we'll get to that later. Uh, but as I started wanting to make a movie, I had to figure out, like, you know, I wanted to do something that I knew that would generate a, a, a lot of buzz and hit a niche audience, which I hear you talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was I went into a ton of research on Bigfoot movies and every Bigfoot movie I saw, 98 percent of them were god awful. I mean, they were terrible. So uh, other than exists at that time, there was no other Bigfoot movie I liked, of course, except for Harry and the Hendersons. But uh, I mean, ob obviously that goes without saying, sir. Obviously. Right, right. <laughs> So I was like, man, I, this is something I could do. And I, I was even in a horrible Bigfoot movie myself. So I was like, I've got to do this great Bigfoot movie, but how can I do that and make it different? So I thought maybe take the whole raunchy horror comedy 80 style vibe going into it. So I, I wanted to do that. And little did I know that when people read the script, at least in Texas, they were going to freak out about it and say, man, this is just way too raunchy. It's got nudity. It's got too much language. You know, I can't be a part of this. So people just started pulling out of the project right away or they didn't show any interest. And even my the guys that were promising me my first money to shoot my very first scene to kind of help get the Indiegogo campaign going, uh, they pulled out at the 11th hour and just ghosted me like a week before. Mm -hmm. So then it was all about, oh, OK, what do we do now? It was like, OK, talk to the wife, talk to my business partner. We're going to just put I'm going to put a lot of this shit on the credit card to get us going. So that's how it started. Mm -hmm. uh, then we tried the Indiegogo thing and I didn't know what the hell I was doing with that. I think we only raised about four grand on the Indiegogo, which was from friends, very... from friends and family, basically. I, man, friends and family don't help me. <laughs> okay. So, okay, good. So you got, four th you got people from th that like Bigfoot apparently. Right. I guess I got people. That, well, I mean, there's probably more friends than family, you know, fair enough, fair enough. Me or fans of my work. Um, but yeah, we got some people there. So we decided to push forward with the, with the, with the project. And then after I shot the the opening sequence to the movie, I thought we had a, a real winner there. So I just kept investing more and more of my own money because at that point, I was just tired of getting screwed over, meeting with investors who were full of shit most of the time. You know, a lot of times, uh, and even some of them had such egos. Sh know, shocking, like, shocking, shocking. Yeah, I was like, dude, I, I just can't handle this. <laughs> I just can't handle any more of these meetings. So I was like, I'll just put in my my money as we go. And we were usually shooting, you know, maybe a day or two a week. So it wasn't too awful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I ended up, uh, because I already own a lot of production gear anyway, because I'm on production company. I think overall, as far as budget, it, for the movie itself, by the time it was over, it, it's six months, I think I spent maybe 20, 25 grand. That's great. Which is still a lot of money. Well, no, it's, 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 it's a lot of money. But in the scope of making a movie... <laughs> Hey, dude, yeah. it's a lot of money for me too. Like, I, you know, to drop, if, if I had, to, if someone just told me like you need to drop twenty five k right now, I'd be like, exactly. I've got, I've got family. I got, yeah. I got after, I've got after got school care. On, is, is do they want summer camp? I don't know. <laughs> well, that, that's the weird thing about the money thing too. As, as and and the investors who you knew were like millionaires. They were such tightwads, man. I mean, that's like, why they're millionaires, sir. That go, like, that's five why. Grand or that's two grand. why. That is why they're millionaires, sir. <laughs> well, we'll get into that another time. But <laughs> sure, sure, sure. But well, they could be like distributor, you know? Yes, they, they exactly. A lot of fucking money from people. Yes. Uh, but it would seem like people who were fans, you know, or they had some money, they they would be willing to write you a check for two or three thousand. So I was like, this is so weird. Friends and family that I know don't want to give any money, but these people I don't freaking know are giving money. It's really weird. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just kept making just enough to keep going. And I was blessed enough that the cast was willing to work for deferment, which we yeah. know is always a bad idea. But in my case, in my experience, I felt like, hey, I'm an honest guy. I'm going to take care of these guys. I know from the numbers this movie should generate 50 to 100 grand at worst. Mm -hmm. That's what I felt, knowing what I knew. Um, but of course that's a whole different story too now. So that's kind of how I got it done. Just a lot of favors. Uh, and then I had to do everything. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention was the cast, the, a lot of the cast I had to either fire or just had to start over with. 
because they were freaking out that there was nudity in the movie and they didn't, you know, there was language. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Everyone's just freaking out about the script all of a sudden. And I grew up watching movies like, uh, you know, Porky's and Hot Dog and American Pie and The Hangover and all that stuff. So I was like, what the hell are these people talking about? Right. You know, and the funny thing was a lot of these people were fans of like Games of Thrones, Game of Thrones. So I was like, how is this movie that bad for you? Like, why are you so freaked out by it? But mm-hmm. anyway, we finally got the right people together. But I had to be the DP. I had to do the gaffing. I had to do the sound mixing. I had to do everything. And luckily, along the way, I, I ran into a relative that my cousin had just married this guy. He was my going to be my relative by marriage. And he's like, man, I want to be a filmmaker. And I had remembered that conversation. And I remember telling him, like, yeah, right, you know, sure, everybody says that. So I called him up and said, man, you said you want to be a filmmaker. So if you want to be a filmmaker and you want to make no money and you want to come be an intern, film me whenever I'm doing my acting in the movie, come on out and you can help. (laughs) So that happened. And that's how we got the movie made. It was like no crew. I mean, I was literally doing wardrobe, craft services, Mm -hmm. you name it. I was Mm -hmm. having to do everything. And I was a lead in the movie. So. It was a lot to keep all that shit in your mind. It was a 24-7 thing that that was all I could focus on. There was no, there was no outside stuff coming in. Like Even if my wife wanted to talk to me, I was like, hey, I can't talk to you right now. <laughs> it's all about the movie today, so sorry. Fair enough, fair enough. So then, all right, so you, so you finish your movie, which is an odyssey in itself, and uh, you, you dropped right. out about 25K out of your own pocket to make this thing happen. What was your distribution strategy? What, what made you like, okay, so how am I – because I'm assuming you were thinking, how am I going to make money with this movie from the very beginning of, course, of this? Of course. Right. But don't say of course because a lot of filmmakers are like, I'm an artist. I'm just going to make a movie just because I'm an artist. You, 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 I'm assuming you knew about the business side of things. So you were right, trying to, right, right. Well, trying to think about it. years of getting screwed over and watching and talking to people for years that have gotten screwed over, I was like – not doing the regular distribution map, man. I'm not going to do that that business model. I'm going to do my self distribution. Mm-hmm. And then I started kind of submitting to film festivals, and I wasn't getting any luck there. They were, and I'm sure they thought the movie at the time. And I think the Me Too movement had just started. Bad time you know, with all this nudity in my movie and all this. I was like, dude, I'm not going to get into anything. But that actually ended up being a blessing that the the local film festival here in Dallas didn't want to screen it. So I was like. Why don't I just put my own screening on? So I did uh, I did two screenings of it. I brought in stand-up comics to open the movie. I did the red carpet. Some people came out, did a documentary of the two screenings. It was awesome. I mean, we had tons of people. I think I think we ended up grossing uh, between fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars off that. That's and awesome. I was like, wow, that was the best thing to ever do. It was so much better because if I would have been in that local film festival, you would have not done. Would have made zero dollars. I want and I want to just say something. So many filmmakers under, don't understand that part of it is like, oh, I just want to put it in a film festival. You're not getting any money from that. Exactly. You know, and especially if you're in a local film festival in Dallas that really no one cares about. No offense to that festival, but there's only three, four, five festivals in the world that anyone even gives two craps about. For, for really, yeah. that mean anything to the bottom line, at least. You know, that mean anything to the bottom line. Maybe Fantastic Fest would probably do well for you, or or Scream Fest, or something like that. I submitted, man. I, no, I, I know, I know. I think I, another movie did, but you know. Yeah, but but that's the point. Movie, you know, I didn't but, know the right people. Right, exactly. And don't get me wrong. My, my last movie did the same thing. I, I you know. I, I got into one big festival, and then after that, like nobody else re- accepted it for whatever uh, stick up their butts. But anyway, right. um, but that that's the thing is, the filmmakers don't understand that if they put their own screening on, they can actually make money. And you know why not? And you, I mean, I have another guy who did a movie uh, that he he made, I think, like uh, upwards of the mids mid five figures off of his screening wow. of one night, one night plus merchandising. Plus, I mean, he built an event. Right. But a lot of people yeah, yeah. underestimate so we had, that. We had, we had these T-shirts there. I bought a hundred T-shirts. Sold all. Made twenty five hundred dollars on the T-shirts because we sold all hundred T-shirts. And there, and there so. you go. I mean, look at that. And then and you're like, damn it, why didn't I have two hundred T-shirts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, well, and and as soon as I did that, my dumbass was thinking, hey man, I can't wait to get this thing out on digital. Big mistake. <laughs> I would have I, – if I, if I were to view – if I would have been consulting you at this point, I would have gone, dude, you got to go to horror conventions, set up a booth and right. s- and sell DVDs, sell Blu-rays uh, and sell even VHS copies if you can make some VHS copies of it because your niche, right. your horror niche loves physical media and you can make a ton of cash touring 
just horror conventions. And you're an actor, so you have fans, so you could be doing autograph right. sessions. That's where I would have told you to go. And you can still do this, by the way. We, we are doing that now. We Good. just did it later. But okay, looking good. back, I'm thinking, you know, why didn't we just hold on? What was this rush to get it on digital? Mm-hmm. When we could have we could have built this buzz and did more of a, a limited theatrical release mm-hmm. and did it in more cities, you know, because of all the, the buzz we generated from the first two screenings. But once we put it out on digital, and, and I also made another mistake. At the beginning of our movie, we put these ski masks on and we told pirate people who pirate movies what we think about them. You know, we told them that we thought they were pieces of shit and they should fucking die. Yeah, you yeah. know, we did all this fun. It, it is, it's, it's meant to be funny, sure. but a serious message. And a lot of people loved it. So we just kept doing this. We would do this at the screenings and we would do videos, you know, with these things. We called them the kidnappers and everybody fucking loved it. But Amazon did not love that. <laughs> so what happened was when the movie came out on December 25th, as you know, your movie gets pirated pretty much within the two hours it comes out on iTunes or any digital platform. Um, they didn't like that overseas too much. So our movie went from having like a 7.5, 8 rating on IMDb to almost like a 2 because all the people who stole the movie gave us a 1 because they didn't like that we were making fun of them for pirating movies. Uh, so ironic, got, ironic, isn't it? So ones within – so when I woke up Christmas morning, my movie went from like seven, eight on IMDb to almost like two. <laughs> it was like, what the hell? I, I mean, I knew piracy was bad, but I didn't know it was that bad. Oh, it, it, it's, it's really they don't bad. play. And especially for your genre. Your genre being horror is, is pretty it's, – right. it's a very pirated genre without question. All right. So you decide to go digital and now you're doing self-distribution. And I think honestly, again, if I would have been consulting you, I'd be like, this is a good uh, candidate for self-distribution. It's a really good cat. It's a smart number. You made the movie for a smart number. It's a good genre, even though you don't have any stars, but horror films, you don't need stars. You have a great hook. Right. Big foot. It, it all makes sense. So you decide to right. go with this little company called Distriber. Now, for everyone listening, uh, at this point, you should know about Distriber and the debacle that has gone on with Distriber. And I was the first one that came out and broke the story about Distriber. And Todd, uh, I met Todd on our Facebook group, Protect Yourself from Distriber, uh, which I launched shortly after my first podcast. And uh, and we've, I mean, I've seen him on, I've seen you posting stuff. And then, of course, you posted that very restraint, uh, restrained uh, YouTube video that um, was very kind and very, you know, <laughs> eloquent. <laughs> And how you perceive the situation, I felt. Um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to get with him. I mean, I'm not going to get much more. <laughs> so I'm being facetious, guys. He tore up everybody who ever talked to him at Distriber, and tore, and and with complete. I completely understand. I completely support that feeling because I'm in the same boat, not in the same exact boat as you are. Do we need to pull are. out the cell phone again? <laughs> no, no, no. Let's not do this now. Let's not do this now. We're recording as we speak, sir. There's no need. But when I saw that video, I was like, you know what, man? I got I think – and I did a little bit more research about you and I was like, you know what, man? I think you're a great story to have on the show because I've talked about Distributor on the show now for, for weeks now. But this is a unique situation because now we're, I wanted to put a face – and also a story behind what the pain that is happening to filmmakers like you are a representation of thousands of filmmakers who are going through this 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 horror story this devastating nuclear bomb that went off in their lives and i wanted to bring you on that's why i wanted to talk about how you made the movie your struggles everything that you've gone through and now so when you go to self distribution you go through distributor explain what happens and then we'll we'll figure out and then we'll talk about the uh, the wheels coming off Okay. Um, well, I started having some issues with Distriber early on, and I did, you know, I wasn't thinking it was going to be as big a deal as it ended up being. But um, in December, we were supposed to have our movie come out December 25th, and I had already paid for Fandango Now and Amazon. They were two of the other platforms I was supposed to be approved to be released on December 25th. So we start, I mean, I'm, I'm all in on this movie. This is like, this is like my last hurrah in the film industry since I've been doing it so long. And I, and I'd made a deal with my wife and everything. Cause I'm, I'm sure she's tired of me being in the industry. She's like, when's the fucking money going to come in? I'm like, it's coming in on this movie. I swear to God, it's coming in. Just, just wait. You know, I'm putting my whole life on it, betting my marriage, betting her money, betting some friends money, betting can everybody's I, money, including my own money. on this and, movie. and can I stop you for a second? I've had that conversation with my wife. Um, we've, if, if any, any filmmaker who's married has had that conversation with their wife, it is not a fun conversation to have. It is, especially when you're, you're, you're doing your own money 
exactly. and then you're working with the family money because it's not your money. It's not like you're living on ramen with four, four roommates somewhere. You got a family. It's a whole other conversation. Ramen, dude. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I'm huh? living on ramen right now. So. <laughs> I am sorry, sir. But I hope it's fucking ramen, bro. I'm I hope so- I hope it's organic ramen at least. Let's move on. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> organic bro i gotta get the 99 cent walmart special fuck Um, all right so go ahead man go ahead yeah yeah and and speaking of that yeah i actually our our loan someone because we did some stuff on best buy i bought the sony a7s mark ii and i had her get that through best buy i think at the time i must have spent four grand on the damn thing because i got the warranty you know all the batteries i went all out on this fucking camera back then and now you probably buy the thing for 1500 bucks so i owe more today on the camera than it's worth and that payment through Best Buy is due before November 1st. So I, I wasn't worried about this, though, because I'm like looking at my reports from distributor, and I'm like, hey, I've got a check for 10000 a check for 5000 and i got all these checks coming in, so I'm not worried about it, you know, until this debacle happens. And now I'm like, holy shit, how am I going to pay my wife, my friends, and survive, you know, until the end of the year? So Dude. that's what I'm freaking out. Now, that's why I'm so exhausted. I'm taking every freaking job I can take no matter what it is, you know, and I'm working 24 seven to just stay afloat at the moment. Cause I literally, I literally went from as an actor working in a Bella Thorne movie. If you know who Bella Thorne is, yeah, of course, yeah. just did a movie with Bella Thorne. It's called Southland. It's going to be an awesome movie. You can look that up. Cause I can't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and having my movie in the top three position on iTunes under horror comedy. So I was just pumping in like $500 a pop in the marketing on all the social media platforms and everything, and I thought, man, I'm gonna. This movie's gonna go great, and I was, and my ego was trying to, to beat out the studio movies, you know. So when I got to third, it wasn't good enough for me. No, I was like, I want to get first because that I can put that, you know, I can do a story on that. We can build more publicity, make even more sales. So I just kept spending more money on the marketing. So the next thing you know, I'm probably in three or four thousand dollar hole in this marketing campaign. But the movie is generating money, and I can see that it is, so it doesn't bother me. I'm like, I'm at least doubling my, whatever I'm spending on marketing, so I'm not. Really, is, I'm not really worried about it because I know the check's coming in from distributor. Obviously. <laughs> but Obviously. Of course, it, didn't. Mm-hmm. it did not come in. So that's where I am right now. I'm in this fucking huge hole, man. And, uh, you know, not, I haven't seen a dollar from distributor from any of uh, the quarters of 2019. No money. So whatsoever. all. So basically, you've never seen a dime off of the digital release of your film yet, even though you're owed I, anywhere between fifteen to $40,000, let's say, somewhere around there. Is that fair to say? I have no idea what I'm owed, to be honest with you. I think the reports are false. I think they, the last thing they said I did total on iTunes was like 700 something units, which I don't believe. Mm-hmm. But you, but you, but you were making, but but, but the report long and you know, only did 700 units, and it's been out for nine months. But the I mean, report, just, but but you had reports saying 5,000, 10,000, 5,000. You saw things that were coming. Yeah, in. yeah, I saw reports saying that, and I and I. And I'm going by what I, the gross of the movie is, not what they're paying me, if that makes sense. Sure, sure, sure. You know, like Amazon takes 50%. So even if they yeah, make yeah, 40, yeah. Amazon pays me 20, you know, whatever. Yeah, sure. yeah whatever it is. Yeah, sure, sure. It's, it's still, it's still $20,000 is still a shit ton of money to me. Yeah, um, of course, of course. So I wasn't worried about the $500 a month on marketing or anything like that. I was, uh, I was feeling good about it. I was feeling great that we were in third place on iTunes and I knew, you know, and the charts just kept going up until this debacle happened and the second i heard i felt it was happening and then i heard what you you guys were going through i pulled all my marketing and then my movie just completely has disappeared it's still on the digital platforms but i mean it's it's nowhere to be found it's so So, far down so you so not only did you make you know take twenty five thousand dollars out of your own pocket to go make this movie then you started taking a loan out to actually do the marketing on this as well as well so so all together how much do you think you've spent on this film Oh God! At least fifty thousand at this point. So you spent about fifty grand on this film at this point, and you would have been—you know—that was a g- good investment to a certain extent because you were making money with it. Like you had a good ROI with your marketing campaign. You—you you were seeing—you know—you put five bucks in. You were seeing either five bucks come out or more. You know right. that, and you were just like, "Well, wait a minute! I'm going to feed this beast. I'm going to just keep feeding exactly. the beast." Um, beast. You were feeding the beast, right? Because you know the money's going to come in. Why wouldn't it? 
it doesn't make any sense why I wouldn't get a check. You never that right. that thought never crossed your mind, right? Never is like right. I thought of the dashboard as kind of like you know, and I would tell my business partners, I was like, look, this is basically our bank account, and when we put money in it, it's just like it's going in the savings. We're going to get it back. You know, that's how I pitched it to them. Oh, <laughs> so because I would be like, look, you can see right here it says fifteen or sixteen thousand. So you know, whatever the number was on that platform, I'm like. And iTunes would would update probably every three days or something like that. And I'd say, hey, you know, if we put in, you know, we put in fifty dollars for that day on that ad, and it and it generated one hundred fifty in revenue. So let's just keep putting, let's keep feeding this monster. So they were all for it, you know. But that wasn't that wasn't an investment from them. That was actually a personal loan I was doing from. So they they were getting that paid back immediately from the first check. It wasn't like oh, so you actually oh, leveraged you leveraged the distributor dashboard. As exactly. proof that you were yes. going to get paid, and that I could pay the loan back easily. The first, yeah, easily because the money was there. And 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 I, in all honesty, there. everything that you were doing made perfect sense, and you weren't scamming anybody. Because I would have said the exact same thing if I was in your situation. I'm like, look, I got twenty dollars, twenty thousand dollars sitting in my distributor account. That's proof that checks. You know, they just got to cut the check next month, and I get that money. It's my money. Why wouldn't right. I get that money? And, and then um, I was going to start to get the. I, I finally, after begging, I got the the first report for the first quarter. It just came in, probably like six, right before this whole debacle happened. Mm-hmm. Probably like six weeks ago. It took forever to get a fucking report from them. Mm-hmm. Of course, but I did get paid. I did <laughs> as I get that first report. They finally give me the check for those five days or whatever I was on from December twenty first. To December thirty first, I got like a two thousand dollar check or something because my my movie was live only for a few days of the fourth mm-hmm. quarter, and that was the last check you got. Yeah, six months after it was due, you know, or whatever the hell. You know? So things, so things, so things were already. There was some fishy stuff going on a year a year ago, a year and a half ago, even that there wow. you could just tell that people were just taking forever to get paid. Things were right. happening because I've heard all these stories and I'm like, yeah, man, it's taking me forever to get reports. I remember that I, I, you know, with my movie, This Is Meg, I just kind of, at a certain point, I just, I just stopped even asking about it because I'm like, ah, oh, it's been out right. forever. If I make, you know, a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, great. It's not, I'm not concerned with it. I got other things I'm, I'm doing. About it. Yeah. I figured it's taking a long time to pay people. Yeah. I'm like, it's taking them a minute. And by the way, I knew people who worked there. I knew the, the CEO. I knew uh, Jason. I knew Neil. I knew all so those knew guys. Mike, Michael, right? The Michael Sorensen. I didn't know my, I met, I think I might've met him at a party at Sundance. I think that might've happened once, but oh, I didn't okay. know him. You knew I, Nick then? I know Nick. I've had on the show. Nick, I had on the oh, show. Wow. Jason, I had on the show. I had Nick twice on the show. I had Jason has been on the show twice. And I think Neil, I had him on once. So I was, I mean, I was all in with this stripper in the early days because wow. they, they took good care of me. Like I got a Hulu deal. I got paid off that Hulu deal. Right. Off of a $5,000 movie. Um, I interviewed multiple uh, case studies of people making millions off a of distributor. Like, so to right. me, in like why, like just like you were like, oh, it's the dashboard. Right. It's gonna be- and that's what I was hearing too. I was hearing that from people, but then you would get these people who would do a video, kind of like a video I found recently. Mm-hmm. They would say how much distributors suck, but it was basically because they weren't making any sales because they didn't know how to market their movie. So right. I wouldn't, I didn't, I just kind of like ignored those kind of. And like, I heard posts. those, I heard those kind of rumblings as well. I'm like, but I, I'm, I, I mean, I'm getting paid. I see other people that I know are getting paid. Right. I just I, I kind of didn't put any 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 merit in it as well because you know if you're angry and you're pissed off I get it and that's fine but th- right. there was no reason there were no real big giant si- uh, signs that the ship was going down and it was going to take no, the rest of us with there nobody was, there knew was it. No signs of that. I mean, it was just people complaining that their movie wasn't you know in the top ten on iTunes or or Amazon stuff like that and uh, yeah, like, which is ridiculous. You, yeah, man. yeah, that's, that's up to you. That's what you signed up for. It's like. If you made a movie that can't make any money, that's your fault. I mean, you can't blame that on the distributor. Exactly. But, they're just they're just a pl- they're just a middleman just trying to get your film out there. Now, at what point did you realize that there was a problem with distributor, and you're like, wait a minute, there's something fishy here? Well, when we started talking, and then I I had uh, I kept I wasn't hearing any responses from them back. I guess at the end of May, it might have been even in June, July, something like that. The responses were taking longer, but I was still getting responses. Still got my report, but then I, I was uh, I was emailing the project manager through the dashboard, whatever the hell, 
saying, hey, I need an ETA on this check. I need this money because w- we were planning on taking a vacation as well over the summer with the check, the first check that was supposed to come in. <sighs> yeah. And that never came in. So not only that, I, am I not paying the wife back? I didn't take her on the vacation I promised her for the summer. So I'm just digging a hole deeper and deeper with my wife constantly with this damn distributor debacle. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, but I said, hey, I did the same thing. Hey, here's the dashboard. You see the checks coming in. I would have done the exact the same thing, dude. Report. When the check comes in, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll go to Hawaii. We'll, we'll go do our thing. I'm going to pay for this great vacation. I'm going to pay you all the money back that you owe me. Everything's fine. You know, I never thought. That I would have done was- the same thing. Anybody in your position would have done the exact same thing because there was no reason to think that a company would not pay you money that you're owed. Right. Or that they could legally get away with this. I, ne- I never in phantom him ever that they could just close up shop, disappear, you know, in the thin air. Because that's what I was telling you. I had somebody, one of my uh, producers said she was in L.A., and I gave her the address to distribute. I said, hey, could you go by there? And she went by and she's like, there's nobody there. And according to the people at this building, they're saying they haven't seen anybody there in like a month or even longer. And I think I told you that information as well. And you and you were doing your stuff as well. And that's when I started thinking, that, oh, shit, we're in trouble. But we didn't you didn't we didn't really have any real answers at that point. But no. check this out. Friday, the 13th of all fucking days. That's when they send me this email from Glass Radner mm-hmm. <laughs> saying, hey, we, done, we understand we owe you money, but our, everything's being handled by Glass Ratner now. And I'm like, well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> yeah, so I got I, 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 was one of, I was probably one of the first to get that email. And oh, when wow. I got that and when I got that email, I made a few phone calls and then I, and then I was sitting on a lot of information uh, that nobody else knew about. And I said, I can't, I can't sit on this. I, I just can't. I have to I have to get this out there because I was already hearing people. I was already getting tweets, like people were tagging me on tweets and posts saying, Alex, I haven't been paid from distributor. This is horrible. What's going on? And, and I just kept hearing a few. And I was like, and it was in the middle of my own thing with my my projects that I had going on with them. And I said, there's something here. So that's when I started getting a little bit more rough with my emails. And I reached out and Michael emailed me back and he said, sorry, we're reorganizing. And when I heard the word reorganizing, I said, oh crap, they're going bankrupt. And that's when I dug in a little deeper and I found out a lot of the information that I was able to release in that first podcast. And, and then I just, and then after that, I just came out guns to blaring because I was and like, no, no, no. Yeah. Haven't they announced that they're going to go bankrupt, have they? No. And that's the thing that really pissed. Well, there's many things that really pissed me off about this whole situation, but the way Glass Ratner has handled this, the way Distributor Go Digital has handled this is atrocious, atrocious. Right. Cause all they have to do, man, look, look, all they had to do, there was going to be pissed. You're going to get pissed off people regardless. Exactly. No one's going to be happy. Nobody wants to hear that you're not going to pay them or there's a problem with your money. Nobody wants to hear that. But the way they handled it, which is this kind of very sneaky, behind closed doors, no information, just kind of this wall of like nothing. The only reason anybody knows about any of this is because I'm the one that came out originally and just started blowing up, blowing everybody up about it. I'm like, dude, this – No. And then, and then they even reached out to me like, dude, you need to stop that. I'm like, no, man, I'm not going to stop that. What you guys doing are, is immoral and horrible. Just, right. just, and I even offered to them. I'm like, dude, if you want to use, like, just let, I'll talk, I'll be your mouthpiece, dude. Just send me right. information so I could just get information out to filmmakers who are struggling and hurting. And we're still at the very early stages of this. Cause I didn't, I didn't know stories like yours. I, I didn't know the scope of this yet. I was just right. like, I'm like, oh, there's a handful of filmmakers are being affected by this. Let me let me get this information out. But then as I started to to really dig into this, I was like, holy crap, we're talking about millions of dollars. We're talking right. about thousands of filmmakers. And it's not like these, you know, guys who live in the Hollywood Hills, like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to buy my Tesla this month. Not right. those guys. It's guys like you and me who are struggling just to make money with our films. And, you know, and and in your case, you're like, right. you're like I'm in real, you're in dire straits because of this situation. Right, right. Well, I think, I, I think, you know, another thing we were talking about earlier when I went, when I went ahead and decided to go with, go forward with making the film, I was watching a lot of these motivational videos, things that motivated me to keep me to push forward. And, right. and the things that would do that would be like watching Kevin Smith talk about, dude, when you want to make your first movie, your parents aren't going to believe in you. Your friends are no fucking person is going to believe in you. And that's why he had to put it, you know, everything on the credit cards. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and sell his and his sell his comic. And then collection. Stallone, of course, when he made Rocky, he's like, man, people were offering me like three hundred thirty grand, and I and I fucking had nothing, and I still wouldn't take it because I knew if I didn't take this role, that I would never, I would be, I'd never be anything. I had to take this role, and I had to hold out. So I mean, and that story, and then of course, you know, Robert Rodriguez making El Mariachi. So every every one of these stories, and even going back as far as swingers, you know, like if if Vince Vaughn and uh, John Favreau didn't power through and make swingers. That was like their first independent movie to do together. There would be no Marvel universe right now. People don't even realize that they did that movie to help launch their careers even more. And then he was able to do Iron Man because of that. You know, it all led is all stepping stone. So we wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for all these guys who started out like where we are in the indie world. There wouldn't be no James Cameron. There wouldn't be any of these guys. All, all, of, them. all of them. Doing all this low budget shit. I think matter of fact, James Cameron was fired Oh, yes, from the spawning. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. and then where he would, and then when he would, uh, he they were doing it in Italy, and then when he was fired, he would sneak into the edit room at night, literally like break into the the editing facility, yeah. re-edit the scenes that the editor had edited the day before, and leave. Wow. And, and then I, I, I've, I've I've studied this this scenario a lot, sir. And then one night he got a deep flu of like a hundred and four degree temperature, and he was and he had delusional like nightmares and dreams, and that is where he came up with, with the image of the ectoskeleton from Terminator, and that's where the Terminator came from. From the Piranha Two firing is why we have the Terminator and James Cameron and yep. everything else he did. Sorry, on, on, on a side note. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, me being like, you know, those those videos and those stories definitely were motivating me to keep me mm-hmm. pushing through this hellacious time, which I, I could go into stories about that, too. Oh, sure. Just, we went through so much hell on this movie, so much hell. I mean, we lost we lost people, like lost, like they died. Oh, the wow. one guy that did come on, uh, this guy, uh, I was in a movie with this guy I didn't even know him. It was a movie called Knuckle Bones, and he played some bum or something in the movie. And come to find out later, that guy was a, a producer on that movie. Well, he was watching me from afar, like on social media, and I didn't even know who he was. And he called me up and said, hey, come meet me at this Chili's. I got something for you. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, what's this guy want? You know, Because all, all, big, all big movie all, deals are done at Chili's, obviously. Yeah, Chili's, man. <laughs> <laughs> but the dude, he writes me a nice check, sends it over, and goes, I got, I got nothing to say, man. I'm, this is not me. Or, this is not a meeting. This is me offering this to you because – I appreciate you and what you're doing. That's all it was. I was like, wow. the hell? And then one other dude uh, that gave us a check kind of like that. Uh, I w- <laughs> There's just funny stories I could go on. We could spend hours talking about them. Uh-huh. Uh, but he did. I was on the way to the airport to pick somebody up. And he's like, where are you at? And I was like, I'm going to the airport. He's like, pull over. I'm like 10 minutes from you. I got a check for you. So it was just stories like that. These these angels just coming out of nowhere. But uh that guy, he the guy who gave me that check at Chili's, he ended up dying December twenty third, a couple of years back, in a house fire. Oh my god! And then the uh, the guy who played the original song, uh, the the song for our movie, he played the drums, and he's in the music video on the Blu ray that we have out. His girlfriend murdered him. Oh, so it was just wow. like this, this fucking cursed. I mean, it was just like death after death. My freaking my my cat, which was my best friend, they helped me get to this movie. He he had to be put down because he was dying. It was just like everybody was dying. My dad died. My aunt died. My uncles died. I mean, like it was just like death. Everybody was losing family members, and people would literally be on set getting phone calls that people were dying or or had died. And I was like, dude, this is Jack. And then my mom, when I was shooting one of the biggest scenes in the movie, went into ICU. Oh Jesus, I, man! I, here I am on set trying to finish the scene, and I'm arguing with actors, and I'm like, dude. I don't want to argue with you. I'm trying to get to the hospital to see my mom. Let's just finish the fucking scene. <laughs> you know, it was, but I had so much money invested in that day. Like you I had spent to. Five or something. I was like, dude, I got to finish this. Everybody just shut the fuck up and let's just get the scene done. You know? Right. But right. yeah, I mean, every day was a hardship, man. It was always a hardship. Something just not going right. As you know, with film, yeah. Murphy's law always comes into play. Now, did you, did you discover, how did you just discover distributor? Uh, I just they do they obviously they were spending filmmakers money or somebody's money on ads because it was popping up everywhere. You couldn't go on Instagram, Facebook, or I don't I don't think you could go on Twitter without something about distributor coming up saying 100% rights you keep them, 100% revenue in your pocket. I mean that was 
That yeah. was what I heard. In profit, in profit faster, as they said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the, the the guy that died in the fire, he had put that movie uh, that movie out, and he saw his first check, and he goes, "Whatever you do with your movie, man." Do not do the normal distribution thing. You get, we got to come up with something different to do with your film. And uh, that's when I thought, man, this distributor thing sounds like the right avenue to go. And I kept talking to people and they said, if you think you can handle the marketing, which most people can't, then go for it. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So I, I literally spent 24-7 on social media looking for fans that would be a fan of my movie. And I'd send them the poster and information about it and everything. And I think now I'm up to like almost 11,000 on Facebook, almost 12,000 on Instagram. So those were my two that I focus on the most. And that's the only reason the movie did as well as it did, because I was on it 24 seven marketing to those fans. That's... But people don't get that. They don't understand. It's like, dude, it's not going to be fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I tell them if you're if you're a good used car salesman and you can sell the worst piece of shit on the lot, that's what you got to be able to do with your movie. Because when you say you made an independent film, there's so many bad ones out there. Most people aren't going to give them a, the time of day, and they sure as hell ain't going to pay for it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And um, was there anybody specifically at Distributor that you worked with a lot that you anything like that? They, I mean, I, I know you've mentioned a few names. Jason Brubaker would, you know, he, he called me a lot at the get go when he saw that I was interested, you know, right. to kind of sell me and push me over the hill to mm-hmm. why I should go with them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And, 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 everything, I, and, and he, he and I seem like we were on the same page. He's a very friendly guy, you know, and it, it seemed like it was the perfect fit for what I wanted to do because I wanted to show filmmakers a new way because every single person, like I said, has said, man, I lost my ass with this movie. It, it, it's been out a year with this dis- distribution company and I've only made like, you know, a thousand bucks or I made no money or I made 5,000. I was like, dude, there's gotta be a better way. I'm going to find a better way. And I'm going to, I'll let you guys in on the loop when I figure it out. <laughs> but this, this was not the better way, unfortunately, but I yeah. thought it, I really thought it was, but you know, Jason was one of those guys that I could reach out to. I could text him. I actually texted him the day after Christmas. You know, I actually texted him on Christmas day when our movie didn't appear on Amazon and he responded the next day. December 26. So that was good that we were at least able to figure out why it wasn't on Amazon. And at that time they were saying it was too offensive to carry or something, but Mm -hmm. they could never get in touch with a real person, Mm -hmm. you know, and they could never give me any real answers. So I just had to go in, cut the, uh, cut the kidnappers out and then have the project manager resubmit the movie to them, which we got on the way. Apparently they didn't like the guys in the ski masks. Uh, Fair enough. Fair enough. That's that's, that's sensitive time. But dude, at that time, everybody was coming out against our movie. Like every horror website, every podcast were like, dude, you can't make movies with nudity like that anymore. And you can't have these sex scenes and you can't have all this language. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> every right. movie has this. Every movie. And they're like, no, it doesn't. And then I'd have to go down a list of like everything. I was like, come on. I'm like, dude, even the movie Forgetting Sarah Marshall has like three penis shots in it. Come on. Every movie there's, has nudity in it. There's and again, your your film is going after a specific niche audience. Like you're right. going, you're going after. I mean, this is not a broad audience kind of film. You know, this is not right. going to find millions and millions and millions of people who are going to probably want to watch this. But for the budget that you saw, shot on, it makes sense. It just made, right. like if you would have spent a half a million on this, or a million on this, that's right. not probably a smart idea. <laughs> you not, know, not without bigger names, not without bigger names, huge names, yeah. But if you understand at the time we were doing this, I was up for some very big – I'll just say they, they did kind of have a little ties with Marvels. I was up for one of those huge, huge roles that was going to be life-changing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I had brought in Billy Blair who was from the Machete series. Yeah. And he had a bunch of movies too. So both of our careers at the time we made this movie a few years back, we were kind of – you know, it was, we were on the up and up. And he had just gotten cast uh, – James Cameron and Robert Rodriguez had just cast him in Elite of Battle Angel. So we didn't know what that meant. We didn't know what his role was going to be in the movie. We didn't know how big it was going to be. Uh, they did cut uh, quite a bit of it out, I think, for the release. But at the time, we were just like, dude, we're, we're, things are going on the up and up for us. We're going to get this movie out. Our acting careers are going great. So we thought by the time this comes out, you know, people will know who we are. <laughs> and now what's the status of the film now? Have you been able to pull your movie off of, of these platforms? What's going on? 
Well, you know, I think she said several movies, Linda had said several movies disappeared on Amazon. Ours was one of the ones that disappeared off of Amazon, the digital part version of it. The Blu-ray is still up there because it's through Screen Team releasing. Mm -hmm. But the digital one is, version is not up there. Somehow it got pulled off. I don't know who pulled it off. I'm almost thinking Amazon did probably. Amazon did that. Yeah, yeah, it yeah was, Amazon. It was not, I think she thought it was distributor who did it or somebody. But No, it's Amazon. They couldn't have done it because they didn't take me down from anything. Mm -hmm. I'm still up on every single platform, and I, I'm sending them emails every couple days. And uh, I think uh, one of the guys the other day gave us out, gave us the email to contact uh, Glass Ratner. Mm -hmm. So I just that too. I've sent emails to Seth, saying, "Hey man, get the damn movie off the platforms, man. I'm going to move on, you know, with a, a, a new distribution deal, or you know, do something else with the movie." So, uh, so what is the plans for your for your movie now in the future? Uh, well, I'm. Wanting to talk to Linda over at Indie Rights. Okay. So that's hopefully going to happen soon. I did send her an email with all my stuff. Hopefully she'll get to that or she may want me to go through the, you know, the submission process. I'm, you're, sure. you're, I'm almost likely you're going to go through the submission process because it's just, she has so much. She's been inundated with yeah. films after this whole right. debacle. She, to everybody, well, I, I, I went, I went, I, I went through the submission process. So you're going right. to have to go through the submission process. I don't mind going through the submission process. I just wanted to have a call with her first. But sure, sure, sure. If she just want to do the call first, then I'll go through the submission process. I mean, sure, sure. It's a little crazy right now with AFM, too. They're going nuts trying to get everything ready for the American well, film they market. Need Creek. Linda, you need Cherokee Creek. It's obviously, a money maker. Obviously. <laughs> obviously, it's a money maker. You've made money with I, it. It's well, a good money. I can tell you, I, made, I, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, and I made 65 It grossed 65 grand doing the things I was doing. So, right. You know, which, so, uh, we can do them better. So. Without, without question. And, um, and now, but you still have the DVDs and Blu-rays. Is that generating any money for you? Uh, I think last check was, it, it grossed about 13 grand so far. That's man, You know, man, that's great. That's great. In a DVD. Yeah. Because again, that genre really does like physical media. So DVD and Blu-ray right. works really well. Um, you really should, if you have a chance, if you're able to do it, um, do you know that? I don't know if you've ever heard that episode of mine. Um, Drew Marvick, who did Pool Party Massacre. Which is kind right, of right, like right, right. Yeah, he 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 actually. I didn't know it was him. He bought our movie at one of the horror conventions, and he was hanging out at a different booth. And I didn't know it was him. And then later on, I, I got a copy of his movie, and I was watching. I was like, dude, that was the guy that bought a copy of our movie. <laughs> yep, and he and sent he, me a hat as well. So he's a cool guy. He, Drew is awesome. Uh, he's been on the show. You should listen to his uh, podcast episode because I I actually even um, use him as a case study in my new book, uh, the film, the Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, because he was able to do something in the horror genre. I just thought was so brilliant because it's similar in your than you because you guys are both low budget horror films that are very niche. He's doing an eighty slasher flick. You're doing like right. an 80s slasher raunchy flick. And right. <clears throat> but what I loved he did, and it was one of the reasons why I called him when I saw it, when he pitched me about being on the show, he was selling VHS copies of his movie. Oh. And they looked amazing. I'm like, they were clamshell. Right. And it, we, we did that for a little while. We did that for a little did while. Did you? And did it work? I'm sure you sold. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I've been trying to get with Screen Team to sell more of those, but you know. I don't know. I think the sales are kind of slowing down with the Blu-ray at this point. I, I don't know. But, but do you have the VHS rights or the Scream team have the right? The, the, they have the VHS They have rights. the rights for the VHS and the Blu-ray for at, at the moment. Uh, you know, Ask them. You, I think if you have a conversation, I'm like, dude, just give me the VHS rights plaque, please. What you do yeah. is this. You go to all your thrift stop, shops around, the, around your neighborhood and around the cities around you and buy every yeah. Disney VHS copy that you see in the clam case. Then you take it back home, get two VHS tapes, and record. That's exactly what Drew did. He recorded over Pinocchio, wow. and, and he labeled it. And he wanted the he had a green series, a yellow series, a red series. That's um, great. And then he just put slips in, and that's how he sold them. And he would sell them wow. for twenty five, thirty bucks a pop because they're unique. And it was so good that people would buy his movie thinking that it was an eighties movie that they just missed. Right. <laughs> that's what I thought. That's what I thought when I saw. I was like. This must be some old movie I missed, you know? Because, you know why? Because he got the poster art guy who was yeah. an artist, uh, a cover artist from the 80s to do uh, it. Because when I saw that cover, I'm like, this looks – I mean I could have seen this on the VHS. I think and, he's making the second one right now. Any year he's about to. I need to call him and say, dude, he, cast me in your movie. He he'll, <laughs> don't, Be careful what you wish for because he'll do it. Um <laughs> No, he's, he's really smart. He's like, sure, $5,000. Come on in. He'll pay. Yeah. I charge all my actors only $5,000 to be I in my movies. I charge movie. all my actors to be in my movies. 
Hey, I, I, I'm guilty. of I, I, We had to do that for ours. I mean, there were people who made those donations, you know. And then, of course, everybody's like, hey, you should cut this person out of the movie. And you're like, uh, can't do that. Sorry. Yeah, ex- <laughs> sorry. It's called uh, f- filmmaking politics, indie film politics, as we like to call it. Um, yeah, if I tell a role to somebody – the kid stays in. <laughs> so, Amen, brother. Amen. I understand completely. I'm not going to cut coming. somebody out that paid and help us make the movie that paid that's to get not, in the movie. That's not smart politics as far as trying to get your movie made and getting it out you there. Know the, the one decision I made that was probably the best decision on casting. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I brought in the guy from Tactical Response that trained uh, Jeremy Renner from mm-hmm. The Hurt Locker. Okay. Yeah, and if you ever see the movie, he's in a really funny scene. But that dude has sold more copies of the movie probably than any of us. He's got like hundreds of thousands of fans, and he runs a tactical training school. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I, I saw that. I saw that, uh, that he posted it on his um, YouTube. Yeah, he posted it on his YouTube. and it probably I don't know where we're at now, but he's, he's like got – Five, six thousand. At least. Yeah. Ten thousand people about how much distributor in there. There are people over at distributors suck. Well, geez, that's great. My cat decided to knock some shit over. Sorry, it's all good. It's all good. We're a li- we're a, we're a live show. I don't edit. It's fine. Um, but so listen, I dude. It wasn't me. Come here. <laughs> this is the guilty one. This little girl right here. Look at that. There you go. She looks. She looks it. <laughs> guilty. Guilty. <laughs> so um. Well, listen, brother, I do appreciate you coming on the show. I, I really wanted to have you on the show because I wanted to kind of really put a face uh, and and a story behind this 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 horrible situation that distributors put us all through. You know, a lot of filmmakers, some filmmakers are hurting a lot worse than, than others. You are hurting, you're one of the, probably one of the harder stories I heard. I know filmmakers who are owed two to $300,000, dude. Like literally two to $300,000. Like they're getting attorneys involved and, and they're trying to, you know, reaching out to the FBI. They're really doing oh. as much as we can. I mean, so that when is- you think you're bad, there's always someone who is owed more or in a worse situation. And I'm not saying that, but you're in a pretty bad situation and I wanted to kind of put you up there. I want to put a spotlight on your story because I think it's important for people that are listening to understand the pain that filmmakers are going through because of this ridiculous horrible situation um and by the people behind it at distributor everybody involved anybody that was complicit in this information knowing about this information and left the company or was you know or whatever because they're like you know this is not for me i'm out of here and didn't do anything to inform any of us about what was going on even on a you know like a simple well a simple I, call. I say it's a crime i say no matter what it's it is a crime sir day, it is a crime it's, it's a crime i mean it it's is a crime, crime. nothing to it it's and it, when you try to explain it to people and even talking to attorneys now that I've tried to talk to about the situation and almost everybody, they still think that distributor because of their name or distribution company, you know, they don't understand. They're like, this happens all the time. And I'm like, no, this is, this is an aggregator that did this. This is not a distribution company. We paid for the services, which they were just basically encoding our movie. And it still really bothers me. It's like, how many freaking, how many fucking people did, did they hire over there? Like, where did all this money go? You, you and I know as well as I do, it doesn't take that many people to – it was taking them, what, 90-plus days to QC a movie and to encode it. Yeah, I mean, I mean look, it's not lattes. It's, it's not I can tell you that. I, I, don't, I don't think they've lost millions of dollars in lattes. You know, I know lattes are expensive, but I don't think that's where it went. Um, and I, I don't know where the money is. I, you know, I originally said mismanagement, but – I don't know what happened. There's no way it's mismanagement. This, this had to be done I, on purpose. I, you know, I don't know what's going on. I don't know the details inside. But with that said, there's so much fishy stuff that's going on, so much information that's, that's come out since we started this whole journey, which has only been around three weeks now. been three, four weeks or something like that that I launched that first podcast. And, and every day, it's, it's more information is coming out. That group that I started, uh, Protect Yourself from, from, from Distributor, there's so much valuable information in there. So many people telling us stories. So many people right. updating us about, hey, I just got this email. Hey, like just today I posted that Rev.com, uh, Glass Ratner or the, the, the uh, assignee or whatever that company is that's taking care of the payments actually sent an email uh, a statement to Rev to say anybody who was a distributor uh, client can get, their, um, can get their closed captioning and subtitles back for free if they can prove that they are the owners of the movie. So that's huge for us because now you don't have to go out and redo it. 
and spend another hundred dollars. I do because my cut's different. So. Well, that's well, that's well, that's on you, sir. <laughs> but um, but generally speaking, if your film hasn't changed, you can get that information. Man, I know guys who did a series; they're gonna have to spend a thousand dollars to get all of oh. the closed captioning back for all of this this whole series that they went through the distributor with. So that's all. I mean, like I don't want to like I'm. It's like a, it's salt in the wound at this point. So that information just came out. I got Linda did a lot of um a lot of legwork on that, and we posted that out. And we've got a big article coming out with the L.A. Times hopefully soon. If I, and if I, I don't know how these guys are walking around not feeling scared. I would be so. Oh no no! I promise you. I promise you. All of them are scared shitless. And the reason why they're scared shitless is because people like me, like Joe, like you, like everybody in the group are not letting this die. And right. all of us listening cannot allow this to die. Because if we just let it, oh, like, oh, I'm just too big. I just don't want to deal with this. I just want to move on. If you do that, right. they win. They win. Right. So we have to and, keep and making it. And that's what I'm trying to explain to my wife, too, because when you're married, this is drama in your life every single oh. day. Mm -hmm. and, and you got to take a call even from the LA times or anybody or the FBI, ever who we're dealing with, you got to do it. You got to do this every single day. But you know, the family life doesn't understand that. You know, they're just like, they want you to wash your hands and just go on. You know, my wife wants me to put this behind us and just get out of the film altogether at this point, you know, because if, she, she just seems the whole, she just sees the whole thing is just, it's an evil business. And there's no way to recover from it. And, I, and I'm trying to say no, there is a way to recover. And yes, I hope to God, you know, when I go with Indy Wrights or somebody like Indy Wrights, I can prove to her there is some good people out there. And that this, this, is, this doesn't happen every day. And I, it happened to thousands of people. We're not the only ones. It wasn't mm -hmm. because I was a dumbass and made some stupid fucking mistake. And signed a horrible, and yeah, signed a horrible predatory distribution deal with some company that just stole everything. That stole from us. And they stole from thousands of people. Right. And, you know, we're going to hold them to the fire for it. We're going to make sure they pay the price for all the shit that they've done. And that's and that's and that's, and that's what we're trying to do. And I think everyone listening, if you are involved with this or even if you're not involved with Distriber, if you can spread the word, if you can keep at it and keep pushing at it and keep the noise up. That's why I'm so excited about the L.A. Times, because they're they're the L.A. Times. You know, that's like, awesome. That is That's a great. huge news I, I gave them everything, man. I gave them my dashboard, my anything that they could use, you know, for right now to help uh, this case. Yeah, and I'm and, and, I, and I told them, please do not minimize it the way that Variety did, you know, and IndieWire. I was like, you got to make sure you're putting in the article. It's thousands of people affected, and millions of dollars, millions of dollars, millions not, of dollars. Not somebody two thousand, you know, five hundred, whatever. That that just minimizes the story. Like it, it's not a big deal. Like you lost a bet on a fight or something. Yeah, I'm really? just I'm I'm just hoping that <clears throat> this does go a little deeper and it sounds like they are going to go a little deeper and I'm very appreciative of IndieWire I'm very appreciative of Variety to even cover this cuz oh, I mean yeah. I'm I'm yeah. even I'm appreciative of No Film School all these guys that came out after I did and and have just put a little bit of shine on it even if it's small or sure. even if it's a little bit bigger it's something but I truly hope that it's, the, start for sure. it's something it's start for sure. I do hope that the LA Times really does um, blow it out of the water, and I do feel it is. By the way, anyone listening, the FBI is aware of the situation because this is this is um, copyright issues. This is fraudulent actions. There is right. there is talks with the FBI. There is talks with the LA District Attorney. This is a serious thing, man. This is no joke, and we have we to need lead to get the, the IRS battle. involved too because oh, that, pay, oh no. guess what? Don't they worry, don't, get paid their taxes. don't worry. Well, IRS is always around, dude. Don't worry. They, that's the yeah. one. Well, the IRS <clears throat> needs to audit them so we can find out how much we got screwed. <laughs> Don't you worry, my friend. They got Al Capone on taxes, brother. So uh, <laughs> they they always get you, no matter what. Yeah. And I really, I really hope that some sort of justice happens. I and and I've said this publicly before, and I know, and, and something that you've said before. I, I've lost hope that we're ever going to get a dime. Back? I don't. I don't truly believe that we're going to get any money back. If, if there's no money there, and these guys are, if there's no money there, the money's been taken, mismanaged, whatever. I don't know if it's going to come back. I hope it does. Maybe we'll get something. But I, I'm not. I'm not waiting for a magical check to show up with all my money. Well, what we need is one of those angels in Hollywood that's got billions of dollars, <laughs> or, or, oh, well, or even the digital platforms who've made all this money off of us to go. Hey, guys. We understand that we were business yes. partners with these pieces of shit. Yes. yes, Why don't we give you some of that money back? Because it seems like, and I can't get iTunes or anybody to comment about what's going on, 
why can't iTunes or any of these people help us? You know, why can't they oh, well, participate in this? There's one company that I know of that is, which is Netflix. Netflix right. is anybody who had a Netflix deal, they're taking care of the situation in one way, shape, or form. So if you're owed money, I think Netflix is going to pay you. Wow. If it's Netflix, but it's Netflix, and that's a special deal that was a contractual deal. It's a SVOD deal. It's not transactional. Yeah. It's a different story. But all of these other companies need to come to the plate because if not, if I'm hoping that the LA story goes national, the LA right. Times story goes national, and a lot of shade gets thrown on these platforms. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Because it's their responsibility to take care of us, the independent filmmakers, because they forced us to go to through to go through these aggregators without any sort of responsibility financially or any fiduciary responsibility, any requirements by the platforms, by these companies to handle their money in the way they handle their money, other than self-regulated. And we see how well that worked with Distriber. So they're, they're on the hook. In my eyes, those companies are all liable. Those companies are all responsible for this situation because they forced us, unlike dealing a distribution I agree, deal. I agree. If you force someone to go with an aggregator that you approve and you've got thousands of movies on your platform underneath that aggregator. Which you're making money on. Who are going to do their research are going to look it up. Like I looked up Distributor and you saw thousands of movies and movies that you saw and had watched before. And you're like, that makes them seem more legitimate. You know, we're, this is, you guys are vetting this company. Basically they vetted distributors saying, Hey, we work with these guys. They're good guys. If I, if I call, if I tell my buddy Bob, and I go, Bob, look, uh, I'm gonna send. Uh, t Todd's gonna do the work for me, right? Todd's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna uh, re re remodel your house, and then all the money is gonna go through Todd. So I'm gonna just send a check to Todd, and then Todd is gonna send the money to you, Bob. Now, if you leave town and don't give the money to Bob, who's on the hook for that? It's not you. You're gone because I told you to go through you. I'm right. on the hook. They're going to come after me. Now, mind you, I'm not as big as these billion-dollar conglomerates, but they are responsible. And the one thing that someone told me, which was great, it's like they might not care about the money, but they do not want a public hanging. They don't want a public hanging. And that is what's going to happen That's if these guys do not do. step up. That's and if these guys don't step up. And let's not even talk about the Go Digital board, which is full of very well-to-do people. And I want to know what they knew, when they knew it, and why the hell has nobody come out and said anything about it? None of the board members, not one board member has made a comment. Not one ex-employee has made a comment about what's going on with Distriber. And they know it's going to, even Glass Ratner has not made a public announcement. If it wasn't for us doing what we're doing, no one would know anything. So all these other guys are all hiding. They're all scared and they don't want they want this to go away, but I promise you, this will not go away because this oh, will, it's not going away. It's not it going to go away because away. the people like you, like me, like Joe, like Linda, everybody else is going to stay on this until something happens for us filmmakers and we get down to the bottom of this. Because it, if we, what I'm it, trying to explain to the other filmmakers in the industry and to because as you hear everybody's like, you see these messages constantly. Well, you're an idiot. Why'd you go with distributor? I told you they were bad. You know all this. Nobody. Dude, knew. It doesn't matter because. If they're allowed to get away with this, then it means another aggregator could do it. The fact yep. that it could even happen should have you scared that it could happen to you because if your movie goes through one of these aggregators, you're not going to get paid. And if your actors are SAG actors, they're not going to get paid. It affects everybody in the industry, every single person, and they should all be concerned about it. They're just like, you know, I, I totally get this all the time. Well, we, we didn't go with distributor, so we're not worried about it. That's all they say, but I'm like, Dude, I've heard that too. You got to worry about it. You got to worry about it because, because if it happens to us, it could happen to you. It could happen to you like, exactly. It, it needs to be regulated. Something has to change with the digital platforms and their business model and the way they're going to handle business going forward after this debacle because no one's protected right now. It just say mm -hmm. right now it's saying, hey, I can just set up as an aggregator, steal all this money for one year and leave, and not a fucking thing happens to me. Mm -hmm. And they're and they're taking advantage of the weakest of our industry, which are independent filmmakers in many ways, uh, exactly. a, a small independent filmmakers. There's thousands of us, and it and it ended up being costing all of us millions of dollars when you add it up. So mm -hmm. somebody's getting away with millions of dollars, 
from all of us. Someone's living on a farm right now. Someone's living on a farm right now, living the life with, 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 you know, with situ, you know, with money that possibly could have gone to us. Right. I know glass. It's not justify. People keep saying, "Hey, you know, well, maybe they spend it on this or that." I'm like, dude, there's no way to justify it. Trying to justify what they did would be like I film auditions for the studios and I do it by myself, right? Mm-hmm. Like people come in and they they audition for all the big Marvel movies or whatever I have a non disclosure agreement with mm-hmm. to film for these different TV shows and movies. I film these auditions. I can't fucking go out and just say, "Oh, well, I I hired fucking fifty fucking people to do that." <laughs> And that's what they did. They, mm-hmm. hired, they have all these people there. And when it literally all they were doing was QCing our movie, which was probably done with software. It didn't really take it. No one was physically sitting there watching the movie without blinking, looking for a mistake. No, it's done with software. Yeah, it's done with software. Yeah, everything was done with software. The QCing was done with software. The encoding oh. was done with software. Oh, and, and there's one little lovely note that I'd love to, I'd like to bring out there. They were charging uh, $1,400 to do subtitling. And captioning sometimes, or part of their their two thousand dollar package or whatever it was, yeah. and then I would say when I did my movie, I'm like, hey, I'm just going to use Rev. dot com to do it, and they're like, oh no, we've heard a lot of bad things about Rev. It's not, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not good. You know, we we we've had a lot of things got kicked back and this and that, and I'm like, oh, all right, well, so it's, it's included in the package, fine. But you know what they did? They just sent it to Rev. Oh my god! That's why they. That's why they so just sent it to bad Rev. mouth the company that they were using. They were bad mouthing the company they were using. Why? Because then they could triple the fee. So oh. if it cost them, uh, if it cost them one hundred and fifty bucks, because it's a dollar a minute. So no, whatever. It's a two hour movie. It's one hundred and twenty bucks. It's ninety bucks if it's a ninety minute movie. They would right. charge you four fifty, five hundred dollars. Oh. Because in the olden days, it used to be six, seven, eight dollars a minute to close caption. They've been rotten for quite a while. No, that that was part of their business model because they needed to make some money somewhere. So they were just trying to to rip off filmmakers every which way they could. They're and like, they we did, had- and we paid them. We gladly paid them for it. So they made their they made their fucking money charging us up front. And even there was with that, no reason to steal our money. But no even reason. with that, but even with that, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to keep the model going. It wasn't enough to keep the company going. And that's that's where we're talking about this mismanagement or some hanky panky going on behind closed doors. But it's BS, man. And and I'm I'm really you know very cautious. Obviously now about any film aggregator out there, but it's a it's a broken model. Even the biggest aggregators out there, and a lot of people I won't name names, but everybody knows the other aggregators out there. They're all self regulated, man. They're all the same thing. It's the exact same things the distributor was doing. They they do they have their money in a separate account for everybody? Maybe, maybe not. No. Uh, you know who has access to that to account? Who has who has who has everything who has, has to change no matter what. It has to change. It has to just change. Happen again. And if we don't do, if we don't continue to make noise about this, I feel real passionate about this. Obviously, you know I do. If we don't continue to make noise about this, this sends the sign to another idiot or another thief or another scam artist out there to open up shop and take advantage of people. And I'm including distribution companies as well in this conversation with predatory right. distribution companies, which is so long overdue for a, a smack in the face because I'm sick and tired of hearing stories like you told me like, oh, don't go with distributors, man, because they're just going to rip you off. I'm tired right. of that normal, everyday BS story that's inherent. It's a, it's a virus that's inside of our business for independent filmmaking and it needs to go away. There are good v- distributors out there. There's Indie Rights. There's, there's um, Terra Films with uh, Joe, Joe, Joe Dane's guys. These guys are honest people, to my knowledge at least. I can't, again, right. always do your research. I'm never, I'm never <laughs> ever going to advocate for a company. I always say, look, in my opinion, I think they're good people. <laughs> Do your research. Be be super duper careful what you say. Uh, because people this- listen. But people listen. But you, it's your responsibility as a producer and as a filmmaker to do your due diligence and to follow up on anything, any recommendation that anyone gives you, let alone me. So right. there are good people out there. There are good people trying to help filmmakers out there that have been around for a long time. But the majority of everybody out there, for ba- lack of a better term, are crooks. They're crooks. Right. They're shady. And, and I'm, I'm talking about the big distribution companies in the end of film space as well. I won't name names. There's some good ones. There's some horrible ones. There's some of them right. that put out 40 or 50 movies a month, a month. And you actually think wow. they're going to put any informa- any kind of marketing budget behind your movie? Zero. No, it's called the shotgun well, approach. Shit if they just make $2,000 off that movie, they're going to line their pockets because of volume. 
Oh, but don't forget that they, but but they're also going to charge you for encoding. They're also going to charge you for closed captioning, and they're going to just start up up upcharging you all this stuff. And don't let's not even get into chargebacks for going to the. uh, That would take another couple hours to discuss chargebacks and and film market payments and all that kind of crap with their model that they have now. Um, Anyway, that's a whole other conversation. I did a whole convers. I did a whole podcast on predatory distributors, but I will continue this this battle with this because I think this is the biggest problem we have. In uh, and I appreciate film. you so much, man, and everybody in the group. You guys are all awesome. If, if it wasn't for this group, I, there's no telling what stupid thing I would have done. You know, who knows? <laughs> you know, but to know that you guys are out there helping with the good fight, that's good, you know. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the show. We got to keep, keep it up. I was contemplating on driving over to L.A. myself, you know. And Finding some people? Yeah, well, let's not do that. Let's not do that, please. Um, I didn't have to shoot anybody. I might punch them in the face. <laughs> just for your own, uh, your own feeling. I get it. I get. It I, don't, it. I, don't, it. I don't. I don't. Advise I don't advise anybody. The, the time to punch them in the face. I'm, I think it's I, worth it. I advise nobody listening to go punch anybody in the face. Let's be clear. There's thousands of us. There's thousands of us. If every single person affected by this. The box goes and punches somebody in the face. Don't do that, please. Don't do Just that. Just punch him. <laughs> Don't do that, sir. I I cannot I cannot uh, I cannot propagate or, or promote this this kind of uh, this kind of action, sir. I cannot. But I see the smile. I, I, see, I, I understand. See it. But I understand your feelings. I truly do. Um, but I cannot, uh, I cannot promote this, uh, this, uh, you know, when I was growing up, we just punched people in the face and it worked, everything got itself worked out. Yeah. I remember those things. This, this could probably require a few punches to the face. And it might be a nut shot, but anyway, uh, <laughs> oh yeah. A couple of those for sure. I got, well, I got to run cause I got an appointment yeah. that I'm late for, but, uh, thank you so much for your time. No, no, thank you. And listen, you're doing, that everybody's doing. Thank you again so much, but, brother. I really do appreciate it. And, uh, keep up the good fight, man. Again, I want to thank Todd for coming on, man, and being so open and raw and honest with us and transparent about what he's going through. It took a lot of bravery to uh, for him to put himself out there like that. So thank you again so much, Todd, for coming on, man, and we're going to keep fighting. We're going to keep doing what we can to help as many filmmakers as humanly possible with this whole Distriber thing. And if you want to get the latest information about Distriber, just go to Facebook and uh, you could look up the word Distriber or find the Facebook group Protect Yourself from Distriber. And that's where all the latest information updates on everything that's going on in the Distriber debacle is there. I will put it in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 357. Also have links to, uh, to Cherokee Creek uh, information about Todd, and then also links to the episodes and podcast in regards to this whole distributor distribution debacle that we're going through, man. So thank you guys for listening. If you haven't already, please head over to filmmakingpodcast.com, subscribe and leave a good review for the show. It really helps us out a lot. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.